Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Today I'm going to dive into something that a few people requested I talk about, which are Nyquist plots. Now, when I was an undergraduate student studying physics, I took an electronics course. And this is when I first learned about what a Nyquist plot was. And honestly, what really I geeked out over Nyquist plots was that they were used in audio engineering. Now, I'm a musician, I love playing music, that's what got me into studying science in the first place. And then when I was learning about electrochemistry and batteries and Nyquist plots came up again, I was like, oh my goodness, like my favorite things have the same common feature, these electrical signal processing diagrams. This is amazing. Now, I love electrochemistry because it's not just the study of batteries, right? It's the study of our brains, neurology. It's the study of our bodies. It's the study of batteries, fuel cells, desalination. And now even some computing technology is being developed that use electrochemical technologies. I really feel like electrochemistry is a field that we're just gonna see more and more development on in years to come. And Nyquist plots are a great tool for us to understand our electrochemical or even electrical systems. Now, before I dive into the math, I want to start with a concept, with an experiment. So let's say I have two batteries, they have different materials inside of them, and they just perform differently when I charge and discharge them. And I wanna know what's causing the differences between these two batteries. Or we know there's a material difference, but I guess what I mean is what's causing the materials to behave differently. And when I say the batteries are performing differently, what I mean is that they lose capacity at different rates as you're cycling them, as you're charging and discharging them over and over and over and over. Now a battery can lose capacity for a variety of reasons, and it really depends on the chemistry inside of the battery. You can go on Google Scholar and type in battery, lithium ion battery capacity fade, and find a million articles on how lithium ions capacity fades. I'm not gonna go into that today because I just need to stick to the point, which is Nyquist plots. I get really excited about all these other things and I wanna talk about them, but today, Nyquist plots. Which, by the way, Nyquist plots are actually named after Harry Nyquist, who was a scientist at Bell Labs and did a lot of research into electrical systems. He used Nyquist plots to look at thermal noise in electrical systems. And if you don't know what Bell Labs is, I encourage you to watch The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel <laughs> and understand what the hype is all about. <laughs> so back to our experiment, we have two batteries and we're trying to understand the capacity fading difference between the two. Well, it turns out that oftentimes capacity fade is somewhat correlated with impedance increase. Now, impedance is like saying resistance, but it includes more things than just resistance because capacitors have impedance, inductors have impedance, all these circuit components have different impedances and a resistor's impedance is just pure resistance. So resistance is a type of impedance. And impedance, the total of impedance, is made out of a real impedance component and an imaginary impedance component. And now before you're like, oh gosh, now you're talking about imaginary stuff, like I don't know what you're talking about, remember that in math, some people had the idea to call certain numbers real and certain numbers imaginary. A real number is like one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. An imaginary number is like i, or the square root of negative one. Now here's the thing, I'm a physicist. I came from physics where imaginary numbers were i, but then I went into electrochemistry and electrical engineering, and all of a sudden, imaginary numbers were j. Now, I like the letter j, it's my name, you know, j for Jill, but it was a little confusing. And the reason they use j instead of i is because i is typically reserved for current. So J equals the square root of negative one, I equals current in electrochemistry and electrical engineering, typically. But J can also be the current density, but that's like capital J, right? In any case, right now, J equals the square root of negative one, which is an imaginary number. Now to measure the impedance of our batteries to understand how their capacity is fading, we wanna hook up our batteries to a potentiostat and perform electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, or EIS. Now when we perform EIS, we're applying a small current to the battery. 
The current we apply is an alternating current or an AC current. This is the representation of the current, where over time we have the current fluctuating between a positive and negative potential. The amplitude of these peaks is the voltage, whereas the distance between the peaks is the frequency. So V is the voltage and omega is the frequency. During EIS, we keep the voltage constant, typically around 5 to 10 millivolts, just a tiny signal. And what we change, the variable we change, is the frequency. So how I like to picture this in a battery is if you picture an AC current, you're taking a wire and you're shaking the electrons back and forth a certain frequency, right? Just a small amount, shaking the electrons back and forth. And also in the battery, you're shaking the ions back and forth. You're just like wiggling them around, like shaking them around, shake around the ions. This, I, I feel silly saying this. And as you shake the ions, as the ions go back and forth really quick inside of the battery, they're going through the different layers of the materials, they're diffusing, they're reacting, they're migrating through the electrolyte, they're just moving through all the parts of the battery. Impedance is like what's stopping the ions from just moving through like just super easily. There's like some energy barriers they have to overcome to get to different parts of the battery. It's kind of like an obstacle course. Picture it's like an obstacle course and during some parts the ions can sprint but in other parts the ions have to like climb through a tunnel and like jump over a bridge. Like they have to like do these crazy feats to get from one side of the battery to the other to participate in the electrochemical reactions. So when you vary the frequency of the applied signal to the battery, what you're doing is highlighting different areas of this obstacle course for the ions. At high frequencies, you're only seeing very quick processes, while at low frequencies, you're seeing more slow processes of the ions. Quick processes are typically like chemical reactions. Slower processes are like diffusion. So let me draw a representation of this frequency that we apply to the battery over time for the EIS measurement. First we apply a very high frequency and it goes to a very low frequency. So first high frequency and then eventually low frequency. And notice how small the amplitude is, right? We're only doing 5 or 10 millivolts signal. And the amplitude stays the same the whole time, only the frequency changes. So what we measure is the impedance Z with respect to the frequency of the signal, which is omega. So we apply this to two batteries. First of all, here is our Nyquist plot. So a Nyquist plot we have on the y-axis, the imaginary impedance, and on the x-axis, the real impedance. And then let's say this is the data we get from the two batteries. So here we have the resulting EIS data plotted in this Nyquist plot for battery 1, which is in black, B1, and battery 2 in blue, which is B2. Now there's a few areas of this Nyquist plot that are probably the most important as a battery scientist when we're trying to interpret this data. The first part is this first gap between the zero point and the beginning of the semicircle. The second component is the semicircle itself. And the third component is this line that just goes off into infinity. The highest frequencies are over here and the lowest frequencies are over here. So over here we're seeing the quickest processes and farther along we're seeing the slower processes. So around here we're seeing reactions and over here we're seeing diffusion. Now you can't really understand everything from a Nyquist plot for uh, studying the system and studying capacity fate of a battery, but it can give you some key areas to look at when you're doing your research. For instance, this first intersection is sometimes called the solution resistance. This can be related to transport properties of your electrolyte. And then the other key feature of this is where this semicircle crosses the x-axis again. This is called the charge transfer resistance, R sub CT. And then this trailing off, this is often called the Warburg impedance. And I just realized I should probably spell out Nyquist for you. <laughs> probably should have done this at the very beginning. So, so this is a Nyquist plot. So you'll notice for both of these two batteries, you have a different solution resistance, you have a different charge transfer resistance, and the Warburg impedance is about the same. 
when you're looking at this data, you want to put it into terms that you can understand a little bit better, just so you can have some way to wrap your head around what's the, what the interworkings of the battery are. And one way to do this is by creating an equivalent circuit. By equivalent circuit, I just mean that instead of just saying, oh, the battery materials do these things, you could say like, oh, well, if we put a capacitor and a resistor in series or in parallel, they'll result, and you change the frequency, the resulting impedance would look like this. It's not like the resistors and capacitors are actually inside the batteries. It's that the battery materials mimic the circuit components. There are four main types of circuit components. Resistors, capacitors, inductors, and memristors. Memristors are pretty freaking cool, but today I need to just focus on what the task at hand, and that means just sticking with resistors and capacitors. So as I said before, resistors and capacitors have their own impedance. And yes, for the capacitor at least, this impedance varies with frequency. For a resistor, the impedance is just equal to the resistance, R. However, for a capacitor, the impedance equals 1 over J omega C, which is an imaginary number times the frequency times the capacitance of the capacitor. So it turns out that this semicircle shape is actually the equivalent of a resistor and a capacitor in parallel. So this is just a little diagram of what you would see denoted when you have a resistor and a capacitor in parallel. So the total impedance of this system with a resistor and capacitor in parallel equals R minus J omega C R squared over 1 plus omega squared C squared R squared. And so as you change the frequency, you get a semicircle. Now the important thing to note is that when you have the imaginary term go to zero, so you have this capacitor go to zero, all you have left is R, a resistance. So that's why they call this the charge transfer resistance. And this point particularly denotes things like electrochemical reactions in the electrodes. Now to get the little solution resistance, typically before this impedance, you have another resistive term, our solution plus that equals Z. Sorry, this whiteboard is not fixed to the wall, so. So this is basically it. I mean, this is a Nyquist plot. This is what you typically get from EIS when you're plotting a battery. And these are some things to think about when you're investigating why you get this impedance curve, relating it to circuit elements, the equivalent circuit. Besides this, you wanna do a lot of different other techniques to investigate why your batteries may be failing, while the capacity may be decreasing, and even using EIS intermittently so if you do it after like the first cycle and then you cycle the battery 50 more times and then you perform EIS again, you could see this charge transfer resistance, for example, increasing and increasing and increasing as the battery capacity decreases. Or maybe you see the opposite effect and the charge transfer resistance decreases as you cycle battery. It really just depends on your battery chemistry. Well, I hope this was really helpful for you and from this you kind of get a glimpse of how you can use a Nyquist plot in battery research. I wanna encourage you to look at the description below to, for more links on papers that I thought were kinda of good to see examples of people using Nyquist plots. I specifically included papers from Jeff Don's group. This is because in the battery industry, he has a very notable group. In fact, right now, his team is working with Tesla and their group has done a lot of work on EIS that has contributed to the field. Another resource I'd recommend besides the papers in the description below is this textbook, Electrochemical Methods by Bard and Faulkner. This is the textbook used in my electrochemistry graduate school course, and there is information on impedance spectroscopy in here. Like As a scientist, I still use this resource today at work. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel. I want to create more videos for you, so please let me know what you'd like to see. I am an electrochemist, I'm a physicist, I nerd out over math and science, so I'm open to ideas. If you really like this and want me to spend even more time working on videos, consider donating to my Patreon account, which I provided a link for in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this provided some clarity on the complex topic of electrochemical impedance spectroscopy and Nyquist plots. 
It took me a few years to wrap my head around the concept. So don't worry if you're a little still confused still, just keep practicing and it'll get easier. Again, thanks for watching and I'll talk to you soon. Have a great day.